All right, we're going to test um, recording the PowerPoint, and I have no idea if it's picking up my voice, if it's picking up the slides. This is a complete test, so I'm going to run through them pretty quickly, and maybe not even all of them, then we'll stop it and see if it worked. I'm talking about Chapter 2. Uh, first thing I want to point out is that we're talking about old white guys who studied children quite a while ago. Uh, these are not necessarily your kids, and even if they discovered some kind of universal pattern, some averages, uh, every child's unique, right? So the more you understand children in general, the more it will help you understand your particular children, the ones you're working with. Um, but every kid's going to break the mold a little bit, right? They're not going to be like any of them say they're going to be like exactly. And, of course, you're different than everybody else, too. So you're going to have to find your own chemistry, what works best between you and the children. And that's one of the joys of teaching. You get to try to do this all the time and think about how is it that my children actually learn? How is it that I actually teach them something? You know, what's my role in their learning process? And your educational philosophy will change over time. But uh, we're just going to talk through some of the old masters, so to speak, to uh, gain some ideas from them. Jean Piaget, he was Swiss, uh, French-speaking Swiss guy, and like at age 10, oh, I can't remember, he, he got involved with a museum guy, he made some observations, he made the observations on birds or something, wrote it to a museum curator who invited him to become a volunteer, and for four years he was studying under this this mollusk expert who then died and so at the age of 14 uh, Jean Piaget was basically left in charge of the museum's mollusk collection and so he started publishing papers uh, and people didn't know how old he was he was invited to meet with other scientists and he kept declining because he was all embarrassed about his age uh, he went to school he got his bachelor's degree when he was 18 he got a PhD when he was 21 uh, and he was just a very successful learner who set off on his own at an early age. He became interested in psychology and philosophy and logic. He became interested in how children were learning and what's the reasoning process. And he started giving little tests to children to see if they understood certain things. And he, he figured out that children in certain age groups tended to make the same mistakes all the time. And that was fine. He was just interested in learning the patterns. And so... Uh, he started coming up with ideas for stages of development. Uh, his work started, I don't know, in the 30s or something, uh, 20s, 30s. It became popular in the 1960s. He is considered the father of constructivism, which I don't know a lot about because I'm not in psychology, but basically learners are constructing knowledge from their experiences. And uh, he was very much a proponent of active learning, uh, learning by doing, and unstructured play was an important thing for him. Very quickly, the stages, sensory motor, sensory motor stage is birth to two to three years, uh, more reflexive behaviors, you're learning motor coordination, uh, sense of permanence of objects, meaning a child starts to figure out during this age that even though something is hidden, it's still there. And I posted a little video on Blackboard uh, that shows the different stages and, you know, where a child, initially, when you play peekaboo, they think it's so funny because you're just disappearing and you're reappearing. Uh, then, you know, somewhere in, in the two to three year old, or, you know, by three years old, they figure out if you hide behind something, you're still there. Or if you hide uh, a toy under the blanket, the toy is still there. Anyway, uh, pre-operational stage, starting around two or three to about six or seven, they start to develop their view of themselves and themselves being separate from others and, and kind of that internal idea of who am I. Developing language very rapidly during this time, not really understanding quantity and conservation of quantity. So depending on, you know, if you have... Uh, two pieces of bread and you cut one in half then they think you have three pieces of bread or 
if you have a ball of clay and then you roll it out to a long snake, they think now there's more material than there was in the ball, that sort of thing. Concrete operational stage, 6 to 7 to 11 to 12. So most kids in elementary school are in what you would call the concrete operational stage. I think it would be worth reading more about what is the concrete operational stage. What are the milestones? What are the achievements during this? I don't have a lot to tell you. Maybe you can contribute something to the book uh, about the concrete operational stage if you think it would be useful. But this is the time during which you're going to be developing logical thought, but not necessarily applying it to hypothetical problems. And uh, the example in the little video was if you give kids the rule, you know, if you hit a glass with a hammer, it will break. And so I hit the so if Susie hits the glass with the hammer, what happens? Well, the hammer breaks the glass. Then you say, okay, now the rule is if you hit the glass with a feather, it will break. And you say, Susie hits the glass with a feather. Did it break? And the answer is usually no, because a feather wouldn't break it. Well, they understand reality, but they're not understanding that logical thought that, well, you gave me a rule that says if you touch it, or you, know, you hit it with a feather, it will break. Um, that comes more in teenagehood to adulthood to, you know, so where you're using your logical operations to solve all kinds of problems and predict things and so forth. Um, Jerome Brunner, Jerome Brunner, uh, I couldn't believe that this guy was still alive. He was born in 1915. He turns 101. October of 2016. As far as I know, he's actually still teaching part-time. He's still in the classroom. So uh, this is pretty incredible. He published The Process of Education in 1960, and uh, his work has been very influential on kind of shaping a lot of the American educational system. He talked about models in the head and developing a model for how something works through hands-on experiences. He talked about education opening up new windows of possibilities, uh, creating new models for what's possible. Discovery learning with a focus on problem solving uh, helps shift motivation to intrinsic rewards that the problem itself becomes rewarding, that a person becomes more of an independent learner if they're focused on this discovery type of learning, uh, that they're able to synthesize more information and do it better. This is a very, very brief overview. Just some tiny little talking points about uh, Jerome Bruner's work. So you could definitely add to it. You could explore it in more detail. We really haven't told you too much about him there. Uh, but he had three levels of development that he talked about. The inactive level, uh, directly manipulating concrete objects, the iconic level or semi-concrete. You have mental images but without direct man manipulation. And the symbolic or abstract level, manipulation of symbols and uh, no longer deal with mental objects. So manipulating variables in the math equation, for example, or I don't know. It, it, these are, I haven't studied these in any depth uh, myself. So I have more to learn on these topics as well. That's a very, very brief uh, talking about Bruner. I'm actually going to stop this video because I don't know if it's actually working. So let me test this out and we'll pick it up later if it worked. Bye.